I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Professor Nitin Govil today. Uh, Nitin Govil is an associate professor in the Department of Critical Studies um, at the University of Southern California, and he did his graduate work in uh, cinema studies at NYU. And before joining USC, um, Nitin taught in the media studies faculty at the University of Virginia, uh, in the communication department at UC San Diego, and he's also had a stint at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, the Film and Media Studies program at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And Nitin's had a very long and already very distinguished career in thinking about global and transnational media formations. It began with his co-authored publications of Global Hollywood in 2001 and Global Hollywood II in 2005 with Toby Miller, John McMuria, and Rick Maxwell. Rick Maxwell, right. Thank you. Um, and he's, he's done a lot of other interesting work that's emerged in journals including Cinema Journal, Television and New Media, Bioscope, South Asian Screen Studies, and the International Journal of uh, Communication. And the book he'll be talking about and the piece of research that he'll be talking about grows out of his book project uh, called Orienting Hollywood. Is that, uh, yeah. A century <laughs> of film culture between Los Angeles and Bombay. Uh, it is a riveting read, I promise you. Thank you. Um, so please join me in welcoming Nitin, and we're all looking forward to hearing more about a century of film technology between Bombay and L.A. Thank you, Aswin, very much. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming out. I wanted to start by uh, thanking the good folks at the Center for South Asian Studies for uh, inviting me, particularly Matthew Hull, uh, Freen Amir, and Janelle Fossler, I was telling some folks beforehand that this is my first time in Ann Arbor, um, but my psychoanalyst is a Michigan grad. <laughs> and so for those of you who know how psychoanalysis works, I sort of, I know, I know a lot about Michigan. I started, following, I started following Michigan football when I started analysis in order to hate him, right? This is how it starts off. That's how transference works. And then as I fell in love with him, I now root for Michigan's, which is it's sort of an interesting, <laughs> so I'm going to go to the end then afterwards and spend probably hundreds of dollars for a jersey or something. Anyway, it's, it's very nice uh, uh, to be here. I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation. Uh, by way of introduction, let me just say I'm basically someone, as uh, Aswin mentioned, who works on media globalization but sort of stumbled uh, into the archive. Uh, about a dozen years ago, while I was still a doctoral student at NYU, I began the project that became this book. Um, and I began by looking at contemporary relations between Hollywood and Bombay cinema. Now, what happened, as many of you probably know, uh, is that in the mid-2000s, everyday journalism, industry discourse, cultural criticism uh, became saturated with narratives of interconnection between the two. Uh, media industries, and we were surrounded every day by images and stories that highlighted the proliferating interconnections between American and Indian media. And so when it came to relations between Hollywood and Bombay cinema, I felt that the contemporary was well accounted for and the future was pretty predictable in terms of co-productions, joint ventures, increasing Hollywood profitability in India, and of course Tom and Anil affirming their bromance. Uh, in front of the Taj, where all lovers go. It's, it seems kind of strange then uh, that while the contemporary seemed somewhat saturated, the historical archive still held out some possibility of discovery. And there's historians in the room, and, and, and you, you all will be familiar with this kind of feeling. So uh, I decided to look further back and look into the archive for traces of this relationship between Hollywood and Bombay cinema digging into the reality and imagination of encounter between them. But now that the book has come out, what remains is a nagging sense of what I didn't get to. And I know that you're all familiar with this feeling as well. So what I'm presenting today is part of a longer follow-up project. It's, it's very much a work in progress uh, that looks at technological exchanges between the American and Indian film industries, beginning in the 1920s uh, with special attention to camera work. Uh, within that larger framework, I'll be talking more today on the trajectory of American, British, and Indian exchanges centered on Technicolor, 
from the 1930s to the early 1950s, when for a brief period there was quite a bit of interest in making Bombay films in Technicolor and shooting international Technicolor productions on location in India. I think that part of this burgeoning interest in the 1950s had to do with director Mehbub Khan's 1952 visit to Hollywood uh, to promote his film On, which was actually shot in 16 millimeter and blown up by Technicolor for its 35 millimeter release. Uh, at one of Mehbub Khan's luncheons with American producers and executives, Hollywood producer Daryl Zanuck urged other Hollywood producers to create a color feature in India. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Khan's Hollywood meetings overlapped with a 14-member Indian film delegation that was also visiting at the time, a delegation led by Raj Kapoor and Nargis at the invitation of American director Frank Capra. Here's a picture of the delegation meeting Harry Truman in the Rose Garden in October 1952, and uh, uh, scholars and fans of Indian cinema will recognize Nargis and her iconic white sari there behind uh, Harry. Earlier in 1952, Frank Campra had att uh, uh, attended the first Indian International Film Festival where he was sent by the U.S. State Department to frolic in the gray zone between espionage and cultural diplomacy and to try to figure out to what degree India was on its way to possible Soviet influence. Capra had such a grand time that he decided to sponsor an Indian film delegation to visit Hollywood later that year. And I've just finished an essay on this early alignment of cinema and Cold War statecraft. And I'll be glad to talk about that in the Q&A if folks are curious. At any rate, Mehbub Khan had come to the U.S. in the mid-1950s, sorry, 1952, to seek a release deal for On with Hollywood executives after securing a deal with Alexander Korda for English, German, and Austrian rights. A screening of On, which was the first all Indian made film printed in Technicolor, was arranged for Nargis, Raj Kapoor, and the other members of the Indian film delegation in 1952. Now, 1952 turned out to be quite a remarkable year, because at the same time that we have clear expressions of inter-industry Technicolor interest in India, Technicolor is actually rapidly becoming an obsolete technology finally brought down by its excessive cost, the fragility of its technology, and the exacting control that Technicolor exerted over all its productions. Also in 1952, Ambalal Patel established India's first color processing laboratory, Film Center, and got the license to market the Belgian Geva Color film in India. There were other processes like Cinecolor and Super Cinecolor, but of course the big one in the, uh, was the entry of Eastman Color, uh, and its critical role in 1960s Bombay cinema, which many of you are familiar with. And my colleague Ranjini Mazumdar is re researching that kind of configuration uh, these days. So I won't say much about Eastman Color, except this. In perhaps the most important blow to Technicolor's international prospects, Eastman Kodak introduced a color film which allowed film producers to produce high quality prints through normal photographic processes rather than sending them back to Technicolor labs for the expensive proprietary process in guess what year, 1952. So in what follows, I'm going to focus on Technicolor's dying technology as the company looked eastward. I'd also like to talk a bit about the imagination that made a kind of technological mobility possible, but also the restrictions of material transport and the limits of the technology itself. I'll also talk more about the Bombay film work of Ernest Haller, who after a long Hollywood career as Warner Brothers' number one cameraman, helped supervise the Technicolor photography for two Indian films, two Hindi films to be more precise, Monsoon and Jansi Kirani in 1952, in the early 1950s. Monsoon was 1950, 1951. <coughs> Ernest Haller had been a, a cameraman for 25 years and had worked for uh, on hundreds of films in and outside Warner Brothers including Jezebel, Dark Victory, and most famously, the picture for which he won the Oscar for Best Cinematography, Gone with the Wind, uh, which is the most iconic Technicolor picture of them all. When it came to uh, its release in India in 1940, Gone with the Wind 
broke box office records in some theaters like the Metro in Bombay. Uh, people know the Metro. It's often a place where uh, Hollywood film uh, was exhibited. Now, some of you may not know what Technicolor is exactly, but kind of like pornography, you, you know it when you see it. Uh, the vibrancy, the, the vivid primary colors, sumptuous, glorious, almost oozy texture. I'm not talking about porn again, te Technicolor. Uh, high contrast uh, color, you can see it even in, the, in, the, in this still here from Gone with the Wind. Uh, uh, very little graininess to the film. Prints that where they still exist, still retain much of their decades-old vividness. And what made these distinctive aesthetics possible was Technicolor's dye transfer printing technique, a proprietary color film process that ran for some 40 years from the mid-1930s to the mid-1970s when it shifted to the cheaper Eastman color process. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to get much time to talk about this, but actually it's very interesting to see what happens as, uh, as sort of Technicolor dies out as a technology and then Technicolor has to figure out what to do as it starts closing down some of its dye, dye transfer plants in London uh, and try, trying to figure out what to do with its used equipment. Uh, uh, those of you who know Dario Argento's work uh, and uh, uh, know Suspiria, which is one of my favorite films, that was printed on a Technicolor machine that was left over from, from, uh, from the London plant. Uh, uh, Technicolor also sold uh, a bunch of uh, its equipment to, uh, to uh, Beijing uh, uh, production houses. And those of you who have seen some of Zhang Yimou's work, uh, uh, films like Judo, et cetera, that are in Technicolor, t it, much, much later, obviously, but taking advantage of that equipment. So it's very interesting to sort of track the trade and traffic in this equipment uh, as part of a kind of global media circuit. And obviously there is a kind of aesthetic um, uh, character uh, uh, to mark this trade as well. I mean, nobody used red, Technicolor red, better than Dario Argento, you know, Profundo Russo, you know, deep red. Ernest Haller was a, a celebrated master of Technicolor cinematography by the end of his studio career. So as Hollywood geared up for location shoots in India amidst American Union protests against overseas production, uh, Eric Hoyt uh, at Madison has written about these, uh, uh, these protests, Haller went on an eight-month assignment in the early 1950s to supervise Technicolor production in India. Haller worked alongside three Technicolor advisors, one of whom was Ernest Day, uh, then on an eight-month Indian stint as a Technicolor technician. And uh, Day went on to uh, film uh, Dr. Zhivago um, uh, and, and other uh, um, uh, uh, work for David Lean. And he relied on his experience in India 30 years later when he served as director of photography for Lean's Passage to India, whose film processing and European release printing was done in, tec in Technicolor's London laboratories. From the beginning, Technicolor film shot in India had to be sent back to London for processing. And in the early 1950s, this ran counter to the increasing interest of Indian producers to shoot an Eastman color, which could take advantage of local labs in Bombay. So while we can see the distribution of foreign expertise and technology in Bombay film production at the time, the John C. Kirani shoot offered Technicolor a laboratory within which to experiment for future projects in India. And I'll be talking more about that in a little while. By the end of his Hollywood career in the late 1940s, Ernest Haller was part of a wave of highly skilled and now for hire technicians who were freed from studio contracts after the Paramount divestiture, free to travel the world through a form of mobility that had already been imagined at the dawn of global Hollywood. This is from 1922. Give us a place to stand and we will film the universe, says the tagline under the Herald. 
Central to this imagination of this global mobility was the intrepid and courageous American cameraman, often likened at the time to Western journalists risking all, seeking the truth, ready to leave at a moment's notice. In advertisements and the trade press, Western cameramen and camera companies put the heroic conception of film technology to good use. And in this framework, India marked the limits of distance traveled, the epitome of the end of the earth itself. And even at its inception, Hollywood was invested in the imaginative geographies that constructed India, in particular as an exotic, enigmatic, and mysterious landscape that was knowable by the heroism and through the heroism of Western cameraman and his technology. It's very interesting how the camera gets a kind of agency, right? This is the story, uh, uh, an intimate story of how a cameraman, uh, uh, sorry, of how a camera travels through uh, uh, the jungles, etc. The trade press of the day describes the intrepid and courageous American cameraman living a life of itinerancy and danger, preserving, uh, uh, sorry, persevering despite tremendous handicaps of every sort. And the American cameraman was seen as part journalist, wild animal wrangler, DIY engineer, linguist, diplomat, and even impromptu American ambassador. American and sometimes European cameramen were seen as attendants to this wondrous technology, intrepid explorers braving the unknown dangers of the mystic East. As one trade article of the time put it, and I quote, whether it be in the vermin-infested, fever-ridden, foul pest holes of Ethiopia, where sanguine butchery seems to have been a pastime, on the high-perched, deadly plateau of Spain, or in the seething vortex of nations that is the Orient, the aim is the same. Get the picture." Unquote. As I've said, India has long marked the limit to Hollywood's geographic imagination and proof of its global reach. India played multiple roles in the spatial orientation of Hollywood. Not only was India critical to signifying Hollywood's desiring directionality, to borrow Sarah Ahmed's wonderful term, but India also emerged as a kind of translation point between Orient and Occident. As Early American film companies sent cameramen on globe-trotting tours to gather footage for the popular scenic shorts of the time. India featured prominently as a stopover between China and the Middle East. From the beginning of Hollywood then, India served as a way to orient the Orient. The imagination of India as a kind of limit, both to Hollywood's distributional reach and its technological capacity, was borne out in the discourse of the time. A 1917 photo play editorial noted that the film is a commonplace object from the heart of Mongolia to the frontiers of India. In early 1920s, Florence Burgess Meehan, while scouring shooting locations in South Asia, claimed that, quote, the Orient receives the cameraman gladly and warmly. It loves the moving pictures, and that most gifted child of the gods who carries a bell and howl is all but revered in most places. The chairman of Mitchell Camera Corporation, which had a local office in Bombay, noted in the late 1930s that while the technique of the Orient is especially backward, the Orient would welcome American cameramen with open arms. The talismanic camera and it, the attendant fantasy of tropical mobility was, of course, a Western presumption. Not only were cameras heavy, but import regulations and duty taxes were often onerous. While their movement was bolstered by these fanciful travelogues, cameras and camera personnel were subject to the rules that governed international movement. Trade quotas and labor restrictions mediated the travel of technology and technicians between India and the West. Not only that, but tropical humidity and heat compounded the need for expensive desiccation and refrigeration of fragile film stock. So we can see how India served as a limit to Western technological capacity so that any cameras that could survive the climate became imbued with a kind of ineluctable mobility, That's sort of testifying to their ruggedness. This is 1937, I think. Those of you who know the history of DuPont, 
think how apt this is as an image for their film processing. India was, for most Hollywood technicians, a, a very backward place. In the early 1930s, the technical consultant for Kodak in Bombay described how local film developing takes place. I quote, machine development is unknown. So is the accepted type of rank and tank development. Instead, practically all developing is done in small horizontal trays, slightly larger than the developing dishes used by a still photographer, and holding only 100 feet of film. The work is done entirely by the natives, and since the natives prefer to sit, or rather squat, on their haunches while working, they cling tenaciously to this method of developing film." Unquote. Another American visitor noticed that the horizontal trays were continually cooled with ice in the heat, and the melting ice would dilute the developing solution and threaten to create uneven densities of contrast. Furthermore, developing chemicals were often in short supply and were sometimes mixed with each other while raw film stock was often obtained from different companies and sources at different times and then combined. And while Indian technicians would parrot the usual servile banalities about honing their craft at the feet of Hollywood's mastery, American visitors to the Bombay industry would routinely return home with stories of the tremendous improvisational ingenuity of Indian camera personnel in maintaining some kind of tonal uniformity to the final film print. Nevertheless, Technicolor was seen as a way of taming India's wild cinema, uh, its wild cinematographic wild, what am I saying? Taming India's cinematographic wild zone by the discipline of a centralized organization and company technicians dedicated to bringing its visual treasures to light. But if the optical unconscious of the Western camera could unlock the untapped riches unseen even by the native cameraman, this was, of course, a deeply racialized technology, especially as color, well, developed. Technical journals at the time advised photographers about the filtering mishaps of photographing dark-complexioned natives, as one 1937 article put it so that you can lighten these swarthy skins to the point where we'll, they will be much more pleasing. Technicolor was integral to this racialized optic. Prem Chaudhary writes of Technicolor's vivid and naturalized contrast of white and brown skin tones in Alexandra Corda's 1937 film, The Drum, noting that it projected racism more blatantly and obviously. My colleague Priya Jaykumar has pointed out how prior to the release of The Drum, British critics had celebrated the appropriateness of Technicolor for films with colonial themes and optics. But there was a material manifestation of this that has not been discussed as much. As The Drum commenced production, half a ton of Technicolor equipment, including cameras, film, refrigeration, storage tanks, and other equipment were flown via Imperial Airways to Karachi and Delhi with two Technicolor executives ac accompanying the shipment. Example of one of Technicolor's three color cameras. This is the one actually that was used to shoot Gone with the Wind. In his memoir, the drum cinematographer describes the rigors of transporting Technicolor's 80 pound three strip camera on location the intense sensitivity of Technicolor stock to heat, remember that air freight compartments did not have air conditioning, constant stops during land travel to purchase ice to cold pack the film stock. And there are a lot of photographs of uh, a, a native ice man stirring the ice in the solution, and special procedures to desiccate the film and then pack it in airtight seals to prevent moisture damaging the film during transit over air and sea. So Technicolor was a finicky and cumbersome technology, but it nevertheless became inscribed within a kind of familiar cinematographer heroism. When he completed the shooting for Monsoon and John Rani in 1952, Ernest Haller described the resilience needed to shoot in India in an account of his time there. I quote Haller here. First of all, the American cameraman going to India should be in excellent health 
and be prepared to protect it during his stay there. Both the climate and the food are pretty rugged by American standards, and it takes a pretty strong constitution to buck them." Unquote. And we can see how this white male heroism played out in technicolor advertising of the time. I, I'm, I guess I'm still talking about porn. I try to use the word tumescence in everything I do. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Maybe my psychoanalyst knows. <laughs> Something to talk about on Monday. Of course, as I've already mentioned, the mobility of the camera in the interwar and the post-war world was more often than not beset by hazards, rules, and the itineraries of physical transport. So with that, let's turn to the travels and travails of Technicolor's late internationalism. In the film world of the late 1940s and early 1950s, Technicolor referred to many things an international American corporation, a full-service photography company, a proprietary process of capture and processing with its distinctive saturated color pigments, creating an aesthetic associated with a kind of lurid exoticism. In practice, Technicolor was a human machine assemblage. Of course, all photography was, but Technicolor was especially tricky. Its cameras were handled by Technicolor's own technicians, who also managed the complex retinue of control measures, grayscale photography, and highlights that aided the production of color processing. After establishing its London laboratory in 1938, Technicolor announced its plans for post-war expansion in 1949, concluding in its in-house journal that the establishment of Technicolor laboratories at various points over the world is a practical necessity. In his annual report for the year ending 1948, Herbert Kalmus, president and general manager of Technicolor Motion Picture Corporation, noted, quote, since the establishment of the Commonwealth of India and the Commonwealth of Pakistan, Technicolor has been approached by a number of motion picture companies there, urging us to establish a Technicolor subsidiary in India. There seems to be an insistent demand for films in color by Technicolor in those countries due to enthusiastic audience response, which we intend to study extensively during the coming year. And he added that such Indian productions could be, services, could be serviced in either the Hollywood or the English Technicolor plant. Throughout the late 1940s and early 1950s, Technicolor commitments were secured for independent American and British features to be shot in India and planned in dual Hindi-English language editions. In the mid-1950s, Technicolor had two plants in Europe, a new one in Paris and the London plant that had been processing Indian prints. Expansion was in the air as Technicolor took note of the various film industries around the world producing in color and attempting to make a foothold in the market before Eastman Kodak's simpler process took hold. Technicolor had been thinking about plants in Rome, in Tokyo, in Bombay, Buenos Aires, and Munich looking to shorten processing delays, minimize foreign exchange and duty problems, and facilitate local employment. That's often how they would sell it to the uh, national governments. And there were sustained rumors of V. Shantaram entering into agreements with Technicolor in 1954 for color production at Raj Kamal Studios. In these and other arrangements, Technicolor advocated for using blocked funds. Unrepatriable Indian profits were a perennial expenditure problem for American companies in India, and I've written about that extensively in my book. And all the kind of inventive ways that uh, Hollywood find to, to spend and expel its rupees in India, rather than converting dollars and taking out foreign exchange. Very tightly controlled at the time. By 1955, Technicolor was diversifying, entering into talks to acquire and merge with other companies, and each film produced in a each film produced in a possible expansion territory was like an advertisement for Technicolor. Herbert Kalmus again announced plans to build Technicolor film processing plants in India and Italy in 1955, with the Indian plant financed with Indian money and Technicolor providing technical know-how, licenses, copyrights, and research equipment. But of course, Technicolor's eastward turn was taking place at the same time that it was dying in the West. And by the mid-1950s, the last American film photographed with the original, original Technicolor 
three-strip camera was made. The production technology was repurposed for 3D and then widescreen film throughout the 1950s, and there were sporadic Hollywood films still printed in Technicolor, like The Godfather. Yet rumors of an Indian Technicolor plant continued even in the 1970s. As late as 1976, the Cine Laboratories Association of Bombay sent a report on the feasibility of setting up a Technicolor plant in India to the Indian Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. This was at the same time that Technicolor was negotiating between Beijing, so it was kind of a, a choice between Beijing and Bombay. In 1980, Technicolor printing was again considered for Hindi, Telugu, and Tamil films as other color film stock prices increased and it became feasible to use Hindustan photofilm stock manufactured at the Uti plant. Of course, most of these initiatives never materialized. But if we turn back to the late 1940s, there's a brief interregnum of promise as Technicolor looked east, particularly towards India. In terms of pictures and profit, 1949 was a record year for Technicolor and it was looking to expand its operations beyond the U.S. and Britain in Africa, Australia, and also India. Kim was a key picture in this regard. Originally, MGM planned for an India shoot in 1938, but shut down because of the advent of the war. The film was revived again in 1942, but shelved at the suggestion of the Office of War Information, who feared that the Orient might be offended by the book's implications of white supremacy and imperialism. In 1948, the newly independent Indian government gave permission to shoot location footage, and Errol Flynn and Paul Lucas went to India under the aegis of the Maharaja of Mysore, who was a particularly ardent fan of Hollywood. And why not, since in the 1920s and then the 1930s, Hollywood had feted uh, Indian royalty throughout that time period, both because of a kind of soft compact with British colonial cinema, but they also fetishized uh, Indian royalty to deflect attention away from ordinary South Asians living in the U.S., and particularly California, who continue to suffer under the deprivations of a racist immigration and citizenship policy. How far we have come since then. Kim was shot in Technicolor, and the film stock was flown in and out of India and packed in dry ice during production in the late 1940s. But there was an even more important film than Kim, of course. In April 1949, Ken McEldowney, the president of Oriental International Pictures, announced an adaptation of Rumor Garden's novel, The River, which is, of course, the one we all know. And remember, but what is often forgotten is that the river was to be only the first of four Technicolor films to be shot in India, all to be directed by uh, Renoir at a cost of $600,000 each. It's a remarkable kind of ambition. These plans were beset by financing difficulties when the rupee and the pound were devalued after financing arrangements had already been made when the Maharajas who were originally doing the financing were supplanted by the authority of the new central government. So this is interesting sort of back and forth between centralized uh, authority and the sort of uh, dying royalty. But we can s clearly see the opportunism of independent outfits like Oriental International Pictures who took advantage of studio cost cutting after the paramount divestiture of the late 1940s. So they're like, you know, let's contact now out of contract Hollywood technicians as the studio system is collapsing. At the same time, let's contact soon to be out of work Maharajas as the Indian state is coming into uh, formation. Kind of an interesting parallel. For example, Oriental International hired technical folk now out of contract with their longtime studio employers to supervise foreign film crews. And this opportunism aligned with a burgeoning interest in Bombay cinema in color filmmaking. So they took advantage of that as well. Before 
the war, Indian producers had color tinted by hand often, using Agfa color and Cinecolor, which had a Philippine licensee and a Bombay plant as well for processing color shorts in the late 1930s. So the proximity was really important. To convince skeptical Indian producers of the quality of a homegrown lab, Ambalal Patel produced a Kashmir shot color film directed by Ezra Mir. The film Pamposh was shot on Geva Color Negative, produced by the Belgian company Gevert, and many early color films in India were filmed in that process, which was a one negative process, fairly simple. And by the mid-1950s, quite a few of India's annual 12 to 15 color productions were being produced in Geva Color. But the possibilities of color had been impacted by the filming of An, which had been a nightmare, kind of very tortured process, difficulties in securing camera equipment and color processing delays, stretched the film's production time to three years. Uh, those of you who know Bombay Cinema know that's not all that uncommon. Now, given this audience, I don't need to extensively, I think, rehearse the history of Bombay Film's industrial crisis in the early 1950s, except to say that with production costs rising in Bombay after the end of World War II, Indian film producers began to seriously think about international returns for their films, especially beyond the traditional diasporic markets, and especially in the United States. Color was seen as a possible savior and integral to Bombay's project of internationalism. And for a short time at least, Technicolor was seen as a constitutive part of this project. So supporting films and projects like The River were seen as integral. Producer Ken McEldowney was originally inspired by a magazine article explaini explaining the Indian need for American industrialization and prepared for The River for two years before shooting took place. So there is a kind of developmental Cold War sort of undercurrent that's going on at the same time. From the production headquarters set up at the Grand Eastern Hotel, Michael Downey got through the labyrinths of customs regulations by doing things like classifying camera lenses as medical optical devices. And there are all sorts of interesting stories about the Technicolor production of the river, like Renoir artificially enhancing the color by occasionally painting the grass green rather than relying on the Technicolor Lab's processing of color effects. It's not surprising Renoir did this given his family ties to Impressionism. Because sunlight filmed on Technicolor would hue towards the red end of the spectrum as the day progressed, shooting had to stop at 4 p.m. And after that, daily rushes were shipped on a nightly basis to the British Technicolor plant for processing Customs officials had to conduct darkroom spot, in, uh, spot in inspections of every reel leaving for Britain, each of which began with a shot of a customs official as an identifying reel. After the completion of the river's shooting in Calcutta, Oriental International Pictures' leftover Technicolor equipment was left for the possible use of local Indian studios with the understanding that OIP could have access to the equipment for any future films. Not only did the cameras and the equipment remain, but because the sets were constructed out of teak and real bricks, as was the customary practice for local craftsmen, rather than the temporary plaster set construction, it was hoped that the river sets would remain for future Technicolor projects. Oriental International's next planned film was to be Keda, a uh, story about elephant hunting. But McEldowney announced in early 1951 that OIP's next picture would be The Life of Gandhi to begin filming that summer with Jean Renoir directing. Again, a kind of possibility here. This was one of two American Gandhi biopics announced that year. But by the end of 1951, there was an emerging critical backlash against a Western production of Gandhi's biography. Again, the Cold War steps in. You know, the um, Nehru had gone to visited the U.S. in 1949, and then we have the, the uh, U.N. Uh, 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 decision on Kashmir in 1953. And there's this very short time period where 
the State Department, U.S., and Hollywood as well is really, really trying to recruit and take advantage of, of uh, the Indian uh, film industry. Lots of back and forth, lots of exchanges in that four-year period. But then things start to decay and collapse uh, very, very quickly in 51, 52. But instead of this Gandhi biopic, Oriental International turned to John C. Kirani, produced by Forrest Judd, who was McEldowney's assistant on the river. Forrest Judd had initially planned to do a film called The World's Delight, to be shot on location in Jaipur and in Bombay's Minerva Movie Tone studio, to be directed by Jean Renoir's nephew, Claude Renoir, who had worked on lighting for the river. But instead, he worked with the director, Shora Modi, who had launched Minerva Movie Tone uh, uh, in 1936, I think, to tell this story of one of the iconic figures in the rebellion against British rule. Of course, Hollywood had tackled the 1857 mutiny before. For example, MGM Technicolor produced a program of historical shorts called the Great Events series in the late 1920s, which included a color silent short on the mutiny called Light of India. It's important to note that these shorts were seen both as interesting filler for silent programs, but also as promotional vehicles to prove the potential of Technicolor's color system. The 1952 production of John C. Kirani was clearly seen as a way to foster U.S.-India film exchange, and there were various connections to the world of Technicolor beyond Ernest Haller's cinematographic career. For example, James Vinning, who had worked on The Red Shoes, another iconic Technicolor production, Powell and Pressburger, was hired as the film's head makeup artist. John C. Kirani, producer Forrest Judd's key collaborator, in addition to the director Shora Modi, was Shorab's brother Keki Modi, whose distribution company Modi Limited distributed United Artists, Selznick, and Alexander Korda films in India. They were about um, 400 theaters at the time showing Hollywood releases uh, in, uh, in India. Keke Modi owned Central Studios in Bombay and was negotiating with Technicolor to build a local plant and laboratories in India in 1952. Keke's Central Studios and Modi's Minerva Movie Tone Studio were revamped. Actually, the process of revamping began for color production in the early 1950s, and Forrest Judd planned a series of 30 half-hour TV films to be shot in color in India, acquiring the services of Ernest Haller as producer photographer for the TV series. Never happened. Each scene in John C. Kirani was shot twice, once in Hindi and then in English, with the intention to release the film to Indian and Western audiences in slightly different versions. In the early and mid-1950s, some Bombay producers got more interested in English language production, and it was thought that hiring more American technicians could help Bombay adapt to the need of Western audiences. This around the same time that signing up for location shoots for the extensive American productions around the world was seen as a way for technicians to take a global tour. John C. Call cost the equivalent of $1.6 million, one of the most expensive films made in India up to that time, and was released in the country in January 1953, the same month that The Robe was scheduled to open in Calcutta in Cinemascope-equipped theaters. And The Robe is actually a much more influential film in the history of Bombay cinema than John C. Kirani. The English version of the film was released in the U.S. by United Artists as The Tiger and the Flame and open to poor reviews. It's an execrable film. I don't advise that you watch. It's really utterly awful. Not so bad that it's good, right? It's just bad. I couldn't even, I sort of screened it again the other day just to remind my, I couldn't even finish it. It's awful. Great makeup though, and it looks gorgeous. Actually, you know, James Vinning who, who did the makeup for the red shoes, the makeup is almost the same as the red shoes. So it kind of looks like it's an, John Sikirani is like another backstage version of the Red Shoes, <laughs> like going on in a different theater, maybe. Of course, part of the problem may have been the very national status of John Sikirani itself. 
After all, color was increasingly seen as a way to save the Bombay industry. Yet, in the early 1950s, the Indian government treated processed color copies of Indian films as regular imports from foreign countries and levied the same import duty of four cents a foot on Indian films processed in London. So Indian color films were classified as foreign as part of a project to save the domestic industry. We can only imagine what Lakshmi Bai, the real Jansi Kirani, would have made of such a scheme. Thank you. Time for questions. Yeah, if anybody has questions, um, is this working? Can you um, if you could use the microphone for our recording, that would be good. Let's start over here. So, so my question might be um, obvious, but maybe not, or the answer might be obvious. Uh, 1951 is the first feature film in color in Japan, oh. and it's a domestic color process by Fuji. Um, and there were experiments with color going all the way back to the early 30s, not in feature film, but in shorts, PR, experimental animation mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And, but the first big film is 1951 it's by Kinoshita Keisuke and it's car called Carmen Goes Home and it's mm. utterly beautiful color reversal film um, and uh, I think it's 1954 when the Southeast Asia Film Festival pops up as well which is a Cold War project to uh, network local regional film festivals film industries in the face of European, North American indifference mm. or and competition. So why Technicolor is, I guess, the question when there are other kinds of options yeah. that are closer, that are also Asian. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I mean, there's so there's Great there's question. political dimension to that. Sure. There's probably a racial dimension to it. There's sure. the history of World War II. Yeah, but also it seems to me that the thing I'm most curious about is you made a gesture towards ident um, uh, imagination, imagining right. relations and things like that. Right and. Uh, at this very moment, there are attempts to imagine an Asian cinema. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I don't exactly know India's relationship to that group, but I'm curious to hear you just talk Thank you. in any way about That's, this. It's a great question uh, and something I had not thought through. Uh, and now I'm, my mind is kind of racing to process what the implications might be. In terms of, Marcus, your central question, you know, why is the Bombay industry looking west rather than east for not only processing but sort of technological exchange? I do think it had a lot to do with the inroads that Hollywood had made up to that time. Uh, there, you know, a little bit later on, as these film festivals are going on, the Bombay film delegations would go. Uh, uh, there. You know, an, another part of that story is, you know, why not Soviet color processes? Uh, Padovkin had come to uh, 
visit India in 1951 as well. Uh, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a funny story about the, when Frank Capra went to the Indian International Film Festival. So festivals are, 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 are crucial here. This is what I'm thinking about your, the 1954 one. Uh, uh, and they, they, they were always part of this kind of Cold War logic. And so at the, at the, at the India International Festival in 52, the first one, uh, there was a clamor between the American, Chinese, and Soviet film delegations about buying up flowers to place on Gandhi's tomb. And the Chinese and the Russian delegation sort of conspired, a rare moment of cooperation, Sino-Soviet cooperation at that time, to buy out the stock of red flowers. And Capra's delegation had to sort of scramble to, to, uh, to find flowers to put on Gandhi's tomb. Uh, the, the, Hollywood was working very hard. Uh, uh, Technicolor was working very hard. But it often just had to do with, with particular personalities, people. Uh, McEldowney is, is absolutely critical to this entire formation. Um, um, uh, Kalmus as well, Capra, uh, Modi. They, they're, they're just a handful of people that are meeting, having conversations. So you know, there, there's something sort of structural, but there's also something really deeply personal. There are personal connections. Uh, I don't know uh, why um, uh, Bombay didn't look to Tokyo. Um, I know that our friend Daisuke Miao has been working on cinematography, uh, and, I, and I think during this time period, I don't know if he's working on color, not because it's black and white, right, that he's doing part of his, uh, his book. In, 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 in your department, or? Oh. Is the dissertation done? Oh, OK. Maybe I'll, I'll get the name of it from you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. I, I, and I think, I'll, uh, like, the structural uh, answer just has to do with the, the, the concern that the U.S. had about Indian sympathies at that time. Uh, it, it, it was seen as a kind of um, uh, sort of fulcrum in, in, in the Cold War battle with the Soviet Union, which is why it's interesting that Kim is this film, given, that, given its topic. Um, uh, so I feel like Th that sort of structural emphasis, the personal connections, uh, and uh, Bombay stars enjoying a tour of Hollywood uh, and on the State Department's dime, um, uh, sort of created the conditions for this kind of interplay. Um, they were. So, I, I, I'm just thinking of, a, of of an image I have of a uh, of a later moment in in '55 when um, Raj Kapoor uh, goes to China. Sounds a great film title, and there's a shot of him meeting Mao. And at that by that moment, the 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 door has closed, right on kind of. The U.S. expecting India's cooperation. I mean, Bandung is about to happen. All these things. It's right on the eve. So I, I'd love to be able to sort of tease out uh, uh, this this contradiction that you name in this dissertation. I'm I'm going to look forward to checking that out. Thank you. A great question. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, a little bit earlier, but the um, Weimar cinema was really vibrant in the 20s, and people like Franz Austin actually filmed in India, sure. and then Fritz Lang did as well after the war. And I was wondering how the Germans fit into this whole transnational network that you've spoken about. Great question. And in the, tw in the 20s, um, there, there was quite a bit of in, uh, uh, exchange between um, 
the Bombay Studios, the early, early Bombay Studios and Bombay Film Stars going over to Germany um, a as part of that sort of brief interregnum. Um, now, during and after World War II, it, it, it wasn't going to happen given the, the role that the subcontinent played in particularly the British effort during the war. Um, but, y you know, the, the question of other European color processing is also an open one. I have not done that part of the project yet. But it's also, um, you know, you have the legacy of a collaboration and a really uh, uh, important one in the 1920s. I mean, Austin, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, why, why is that not picked up a, a, a few years after the end of World War II in the 50s, let's say? German industrialization is underway, et cetera. Like, why is that not picked up? It's, you know, why is Tokyo not picked up? I, I just don't, it, 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 it's, it's baffling, and I'm, I'd love to find out, again, those traces of, uh, especially projects that were um, anticipated or in the early stages. There may have been something early on with Fuji, you know that didn't materialize. It's hard to find the traces of those. I've, I haven't done archival work in, in Germany or in, in, in Japan to, to, to work this through. But that's another very fruitful direction to take things. I appreciate your question. Yeah. Dan. So this is a little meta or methodological, but I wonder if you could speak, because you're, what I really like about this talk and so much of your work is that you're really charting this transnational network in, in multiple sites, and it's behind the screen, below the screen, or whatever. So I wonder if you could speak to the transnational archive that you're drawing from to kind of, tr as its own kind of network um, in terms, of, and then in, in the way you're constructing a, a national of trans, a, a narrative of transnational exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, My colleagues in Indian media in the room w are well familiar, as, as probably are s some of you, given the context in which you work, of the, stat, the state of the archive in India. Uh, and uh, there are sort of precious few documents that one can trace where, you know, they're not indexed, how to find them. It, it, it's, it's, it's quite accidental. You know, you sort of, st again, stumbling around um, and, and you find something and it, it, it just teases things out. So, for example, as I was working on the, the Capra Kapoor exchange in 52, I, I saw that Mehboob Khan was there for, um, for, for on and there was a conversation about Technicolor. And then I had to sort of work and sort of figure out, go, to, go and find sort of Technicolor. Uh, and and the, the, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences thankfully has um, copies of Technicolor's um, uh, in-house journal um, that provided some of this stuff. And then once you have a clue of things, okay, here was this film. Because it's a film, John C. Kiran's film is not really talked about. I mean, sure, more of these uh, much better known for other films that he made later in his career. He's quite a well-known director. But this particular film um, is not one that's talked about. And this particular history is not talked about either because it didn't really do anything. Um, it didn't amount to, you know, something big that you could point to and say, oh, here's a success. Let's, let's, let's build on that. So in many ways, the, the, the sort of precarity of the archive is, is matched by the kind of uh, narratives of failure that this sort of project is built on. Um, and methodologically, it's one of the things that I wanted to do differently than global Hollywood. Um, one of the uh, things that I don't like about global Hollywood um, is, uh, is um, sort of the it's about the successes. 
you know, it, it, it's about it, it, it sort of hammering that sort of cultural imperialist uh, m way of thinking. I'll blame Toby for that, not me. Um, uh, but uh, you, you know, the, the, these are the you know big budget films, exploitation on a large scale, um, and, and so when one can point to it and, and place it within a kind of structure. Um, and there's, there's a methodology there as well, because one can talk about, you know, uh, modernization theory and developmentalist critique and, and two-way flows, etc. But, but I, a, a lot of these things are little, you know. Um, the, even the, the India film delegation, um, which, which, had, which just gets a mention, uh, a, a one-line mention in most histories, of, of Bombay cinema um, uh, was, was, was a, a little thing. The State Department, I have the State Department contract. It was like $40,000 to pay for everything. It was, a, it was a 10 day tour. Met lots and lots of uh, people, but it was, it was a holiday, you know? But, but it, it was nonetheless really integral when positioned in these sort of, these global geopolitical forces that are taking place at the time. So, in some ways, Dan, I, I, I feel like the, the methodology is how to narrate a kind of minor trajectory without subsuming it within a kind of globalist logic. Um, and it's, it's, it's a turn that sort of global Hollywood makes relentlessly at every, like, th and this is why this happened. Um, and, uh, It's, it's, it's accident. It's the virtue of the accident, I feel like, that gets to this. Thank you for your question. Since you used the word accident and encounter, I have a question. But just before that, very quickly, to follow up on Marcus's question, um, have you found any traces of um, Madras at that moment in particular, around the late 40s to 50s? Because there are some traces of that particular film industrial formation looking towards Singapore as a point of call, in right. part because of audience market sort of desires and so on. Absolutely. That older trajectory of Tamil diaspora there. Absolutely. So perhaps there's something to be mined in that sure. trajectory to sure. see if, because especially, was it 51 or 52, the big Singapore get together uh, for building together this Asian coalition? Um, I forget which year it was, but a former colleague of ours writes about it, Sang mm. Jun Lee, who's in Singapore. Oh, right. Um, so I'm wondering, because the Chennai thing always had a direct tie to Singapore, yeah. because it was mercantile financing from there. Absolutely. So perhaps there's something to explore. I'm not sure. I'll dig into Swarnavel Pillai's book to see if there are any footnotes there. Me too. There. I don't know. Me too. Um, it, you know, that's when it's part of the, the provincialism of <laughs> I I Indian film studies, isn't yeah. it? That, you know, I work on Bombay <laughs> and so Madras is somewhere else. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's entirely possible given that circuit, yeah. you know, perhaps, m you know, Malaysia, Singapore, yeah. as you're saying, because of the diasporic connections, yeah. maybe there's... And they were actively filming there on Absolutely. location at the time. That's right. There were Th lots of Sivaji Ganeshan films on That's location right. in Singapore and Malaysia. That's right. That's right. As Bombay so, went to Europe to yeah. f do its kind of global these iconic shot, these up. guys went. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So there may be something. Right. But the question I have, this is sort of a total sidebar, but... I was struck by the equipment being left behind and then people doing something else with it in terms of imagining other uses. And there being a uh, transmedia narrative about this found equipment thing. The same thing happens with shortwave receivers being left behind in Colombo and Radio Ceylon gets going. Which you've written about. Um, Durdashan after the 1976 Philips exhibition in Delhi, television equipment gets left behind and there are little television experiments that get going. Is this something you're thinking about more broadly about well, I am now. happenstance, found <laughs> equipment, both aesthetic as well as technological innovations that happen? And Sudhir Mahadevan's work does a little bit of for this. For sure, for sure. No, it's a very, very good question. Um, you know, unlike the the uh, uh, shortwave receivers and so the television equipment, the intention was to leave it behind, but it actually was not left behind. Um, w once, they, once they realized that th there's not going to be money to be made, they wanted the stuff back. Or at least they wanted, they wanted to be paid for it. Um, uh, so, uh, and hence the Beijing versus Bombay thing around the, 
the processing plant in the in the 1970s that I think Beijing uh, 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 production companies paid almost eight million dollars for, and Bombay was just not going to pay that kind of money, especially in the in the mid 70s. Right? There's just no way. Um, but yeah, you know, I. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, w one other thing to think about in, that, that, that's linked to your question is what also to do with technique that is left over? Uh, how, how much did that impact and transform? And like all techniques, and this is, you know, Sudhir writes about this too, you know, th there's a kind of indigenization that happens. Um, Technicolor was so, so much a black box technology, you know, unlike, you know, uh, Sudhir talking about, you know, Kodak Brownie cameras and refiguring re, re, re those, taking them apart, putting them up together in different ways. T you know, uh, uh, Technicolor would send its personnel to a company, you know, l like, like, a, like an artifact, you know, uh, to, they, they, had, they were there. It's, they had access. Um, even even the director of photography or the cameraman for the film oftentimes wouldn't actually press. So there's this strange kind, kind of tactile relationship uh, that secures the 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 um, technology within a kind of uh, 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 ownership structure. But people are watching and paying attention, uh, and I just don't know how that translated. Um, within that context, but I should find out. Just a quick footnote. Sure. Is, um, that just, that just last summer, in the, I found these in the archive. Very similar story with early broadcasting, mm. where they refused to let local manufacturing get going in the mid to late 1930s. And the equipment that was sent from Britain to various parts of colonial India and Nepal were designed in such a way, as the archives put it, so the natives wouldn't tamper with it. Oh, right. So the radio sets, they were trying to design them with a timer so that it would come on at the appropriate moment and shut off at the appropriate moment yeah. so that there would be no, so it was literally a black box of sorts. Yeah. But then that, within about three or four years, it all gets undercut by the wartime propaganda news. Right. So I think that you're onto something about technique and what the black box, but it's a very short piece. It's very it short. Very quickly. Yeah, it does, it does. Now these connections are fascinating. Fascinating, Marcus. You wanted to follow up. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question here too. Yeah. Sort of an outsider to film and the media studies thing, so it is a different wavelength. Uh, I wanted you to talk a little more about color in two respects. I mean, more the the aesthetics. Uh, you mentioned something about Technicolor and the way in which it was presenting or representing racial difference. Does it differ from the other technologies which succeeded it in this? Uh, and how does this then relate to what seems to come to dominate Bollywood mm. cinema, which is huge uses of makeup? And is the relation of makeup to the representation of mm. skin color an Im mm. important question? Mm. The second side is, is much more uh, general. Have you looked at what the response, the reception is to color films within the Indian audience? Uh, what struck them? Mm. How did it, you know, what, is this color absolutely unrealistic, fantastic, out of this world in comparison to how black and white monochromatic uh, cinema was perceived? Is yeah. it very realistic? Sure. I mean, you have the chromolithographs and the God pictures coming, you know, and a whole set of, sure. you know, modern colors within an sure. Indian sure. aesthesis, Great connection. Right. you know, for uh, 60, 70 years by this point. So I'm just Absolutely. wondering, and then I'm wondering whether there's, in, in that discourse, how the change from Technicolor to the uh, Belgian or the, the Kota, uh, Eastman color yeah. did. I mean, are there, is there a discourse on, you know, different kinds of colors mm. in relationship to mm. those? Great questions. I mean, I lo I'm thinking about um, Kadri Jain's book on Indian calendar art. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Chris, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, uh, 
a, a, a lot of uh, film magazines of the time sort of used that kind of imagery. Film India it looks like calendar art, same kind of color that the, 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 the uh, actors picturized with the same kind of tones that gods were in the, in the calendars. So there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very it's a fascinating connection. Um, you know, I think that these, uh, n maybe not so much the river, but certainly um, John C. Kirani, it, it's a bit of a stunt. Uh, and and H Hollywood has uh, uh, done this many, many times um, in India. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, in my book I talk about this long uh, century of, of fascination. Um, and th there's always an attempt to, um, l let's just try something and, and, and see if it works. Um, uh, uh, and so there's not a considered sort of development, will this work in an Indian audience, will this be successful, will it be thought through? It's very improvisational. Um, and it, 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 it happened After they did it, did you have a sense of, did it work, or what was the response? Yeah, this did not work. This did, th th that's right. The, the, the Technicolor thing did not work. That might have been, sense. well, it, it, people didn't, th well, the films were bad, first of all. So Regardless people didn't, of the color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 the color is like the one thing that they were good for. Uh, and the makeup, right? Um, no, the film, the film, the films, the, the again, not the river, which is a wonderful film, but John C. Was the river a success in India? The river wasn't w super widely distributed. You know, it was kind of was yeah. You know, it's a kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of more for the European market. It was seen, but not widely seen. Um, uh, and uh, the intelligentsia, etc., would have had a way to see it in the subcontinent, but it's European. Um, but uh, uh, so. Uh, Color at this time is still, there, were, there was some color film, it's still sort of a special effect, you know. Um, but very, very quickly, within, within a decade or so, um, Bombay would, Bombay filmmaking would really embrace color. Uh, and the, the films of the 1960s especially, that many of you know, um, are, are, are sort of the height of Bombay's lavishness, um, its European travels. Um, bright saris and outfits in, in, in Scotland and in, in, in the Alps and, you know, all the, the again, for, because of the, contra the color contrasts. Um, uh, but those, those uh, processes were much cheaper. They had, um, some of them had local um, uh, uh, plants to work in. Many of them were still being done in London, and so they were still expensive and had to negotiate these kinds of import restrictions, et cetera. Uh, a lot of um, sound, um, um, you know, because there wasn't that much sync sound. Uh, so a, a, lot of, a lot of dubbing and a lot of uh, uh, sort of post-sync stuff was done in London studios. Uh, so there was a kind of circuit between the two, yeah. So, yeah, there's a... Color is certainly new. Um, uh, it, it's something that the, that um, Minerva Movie Tone, uh, um, Shorab Modi's company, was very interested in. You know, let's 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 establish that foothold. But it, it's so weird that it was Technicolor that that got involved with the that process. Was my question. Okay. I, I did some I'm sorry. In the 70s They had a really sense of difference between ectochrome and codochrome. Mm. They could talk about it. Mm. But I, so that was my question. With I see. To yeah. Being, okay. Being not the existence of color, but the kind sure. of color. Sure. Yeah, I don't. Color. Yeah. Indian homes are in pastels. Indian god pictures are not. Sure. I don't think Chris Pitty ever talked about no, color in that sense. Right. No, you're right. So I'm wondering whether, you know, we can, you know, you know, from the point of view of one discipline, this is terribly fascinating. From the right. point of view of somebody who wants to understand something about Indian culture, this mm. is insignificant mm. unless you're going to translate it into sure. reception. Sure. So that was my sure. concern, but you haven't looked at no, the certainly, meaning of color yet. Yeah, certainly not in terms of the, the filmmakers, which I would be more interested in than... Well, exactly. They have to Absolutely. responding. I mean, if they're, if they're yeah. looking for... You, the one thing 
housing you explained, well, they're interested in a foreign market. Yeah. So then they're going to be set, and they're foreigners coming in, and they have sure. a foreign aesthetic. And, sure. And that, that, makes, that makes total sense. Sure. But I'm interested in what works yeah. and what doesn't work yeah. in the Indian market. Yeah, it's a good question. Especially since there's plenty of black and white films still being sure. around at the same time. Sure, sure. Well, there's a lot of color Hollywood. Right, yeah, so 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 I I, I I feel like that may be also why there was a kind of link, because then yeah. Bombay film could look. There's always an aspirational yeah. motivation, right? Bombay cinema can look like Hollywood, well, right? That's, that's interesting, given the rise of nationalism and all this indigenous. Absolutely, stuff. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank no, thank you. This one mentioned Sanjun Lee, and uh, I was actually thinking about Sanjun as well the minute you brought up State Department subvention, yeah. because one of the things that he's been studying is the role of the CIA in the film cultures in Asia. Yeah, and that yeah. Mm -hmm. so I mean, this is. I'm meeting him. For the, we're on a panel together in okay. at ICA. So I'm you meeting can him for the tell first him how time. You so go about I will. Such You'll a be thing. there, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it could very well be that. That's part of the picture, too. I just will say real quick, uh, there's some interesting stories uh, about the CIA. Uh, in general, uh, uh, but, but <laughs> they are. Um, uh, and they're, right, and, they're, and they're, uh, particularly in sort of intervening in this relationship, uh, there and, and the two I can think of off the top of my head, I get, like the archive, like this is why Sanjun's work is so interesting. How do you get access to these materials? Um, two stories that are film related uh, between Hollywood and, and, and Bombay around the CIA. One is uh, in 1960, 1961, uh, there are rumors in Washington of John F. Kennedy's affair with Angie Dickinson and a CIA officer who had been posted in Delhi uh, knew of Nehru's predilection for white women, you know, the Lady Mountbatten thing, and also how much he loved Rio Bravo, which had been shown. Uh, the Warner Brothers had sent over a print to, to, uh, to Nehru. Uh, to watch. And so they sort of spirited away Angie, put her on a world tour as the press was starting to get wind of this. Angie just cannot be in the U.S. right now. And she went over and there's, a, there's, a, there's an account in a CIA biography that I read a few years ago of Angie Dickinson's um, uh, encounter and flirtation with Nehru. Um, a second one, which I have written a little bit about, um, has to do with uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, which, although it's set in, in Kandahar, um, was filmed in and around Chandigarh uh, in India. There was a, 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 a wiki, part of a WikiLeaks release of cables. There was a, it was a, was a CIA, a, again, like, a, an idea, it never, it never went anywhere, but there's a, there is a, a CIA cable that was released um, that was asking whether or not, given the popularity of Hindi film in Afghanistan, whether or not some film stars could come over and visit and be seen with American servicemen in the country to try to soften the... The Cold War is a long, has a long aftermath, and we're obviously living in it now. But uh, I'd love to know more. Like those are those are some like bookends, uh, and I, I I recently published a piece on Zero Dark Thirty um, that talks a little bit about the CIA um, um, in that capacity. But I'd love to know more. Again, how would you find it? How would you you know how would you get these archives? Yeah. Two yeah. days ago in the Wire, uh, large, large story is an excerpt from a book how the CIA sponsored Indian magazines that engaged the country's best writers, and it's. Precisely the infiltration from the 1950s. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, on the spot research. I 
love it. I read it this morning. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.